morning, One Chapel family. Welcome to Online Church. I'm so excited you're going to worship with us this morning. Let's sing this out together. I saw Satan fall. I saw Satan fall. I lied. I saw darkness run for God. Christ the righteous, I'm justified. 
This is my testimony. This is my testimony. Sing it loud as your name. Sing it.
Good morning, One Chapel! Welcome to church. If you're new to One Chapel, take a moment and fill out a connection card. You can click the link in the chat or you can scan the QR code. And you can always visit our five minute party right after service. This is a great chance to meet our pastors and leaders and find out how to become connected. If you visit the five minute party, we have a small gift for you. Honestly, it's not that big a deal. It's just the One Chapel Coffee Mug. The One Chapel Coffee Mug. The One Chapel Coffee Mug. The One Chapel Coffee Mug, right here. This August, we are kicking off our 21 days of prayer. We believe prayer has to be at the center of our lives as believers, and there's something powerful that happens when the whole church sets aside time to pray together. 21 days of prayer begins August 8th. We will have morning prayer meetings. 6.30 a.m., what a way to start the day. Exactly, Rob. Starting next Monday, everyone say next Monday. We will have 6.30 a.m. prayer meetings and then end with an all church prayer night on Friday, August 27th at 7 p.m. Let's come together as a church family and seek God for our lives, our church, and our city. Join us for 21 days of prayer. Summer is winding down. That means cooler weather is coming eventually, right? Like it gets cooler eventually. We know a lot of you are making fall plans. And we would love being a part of a group to be a part of those fall plans. Starting a group is a great way to build community in your life and in our church family. If you were interested in starting a group, just go to onechapel.com slash groups. And if you're not going to lead a group, plan on joining a group this fall. If you wanna see all the groups currently meeting, just go to onechapel.com slash groups. And we'll be rolling out many more this fall. Wow, I love that perspective. It's like a caveman. <laughs> be in our family. We'd love for you to be in, I don't know what I'm saying, to click that comment link, uh, the, the link in the comments, sorry, the link, blah, blah. You gotta do it again! All right, I want to tell you about one of my pet peeves. Y'all have pet peeves? Does anybody have pet peeves? <laughs> Not just me, right? Okay, so one of my pet peeves is, what is for dinner tonight? <laughs> Can you relate? Ah, oh, yes. What is for dinner tonight? Now, I don't have to be concerned too much about that anymore because my kids are grown. But when my four boys, that's right, I said four boys, you can groan for me now. When my four boys were little growing up, Michael and I believed very much in having dinner together as a family. And so every night we did. No technology, no TV, just us sitting at the table. It was sometimes a circus, but we did it. And so that meant that every night I needed to cook dinner. I wanna tell you guys, hats off to you moms and dads who do this every night. It's impressive because you know what? Every morning, yes, I said morning, I would wake up and I would say, oh, what's for dinner tonight? I got to decide what's for dinner. Now, listen, it was an ordeal because first of all, I got to decide what's everybody going to eat? And then I got to decide, well, do I have all the ingredients? And if I don't, well, then I got to go to the grocery store. Okay, did I say I had four boys? So I got to strap all them in the car. And of course, they're boys, so they fight the whole time. I got to get to the grocery, get all the ingredients, get home. And then I've got to decide, well, do I have time to prep, prep it? Like how much time? Because, you know, I think karate's tonight. And I know we have t-ball practice at 4.30. Wait a minute. Did I forget about, oh, my goodness, we've got something else too. Karate. There's always something going on. So I, I don't know. Wouldn't you love to just be like, Today, I'm gonna to decide what's for dinner, and from this point on, it's decided. I never have to decide again, but it's something different every night, and everybody loves it. So I, I was just thinking about that, and I was thinking, wow, you know, we make decisions every day that's hard, harder than what's for dinner, and it's because hard things come in our life. Have you ever felt like, oh man, 
it's just another hard thing after another is being tossed at me. And I got to deal with this now. And I've got to decide how I'm going to respond to this. Do you ever wish like I do, like when a hard thing comes in my life, then I'm going to learn this lesson, (laughs) right? I'm finally going to learn this lesson. And if I ever have to deal with it again, it's not going to be a problem. You know why? Because I've already made the decision. I know I'm going to respond and my emotions are going to follow and it's just going to happen. That doesn't really happen, does it? And I'm talking about harder things too, like an example of anger, okay? I lose my temper sometimes. Don't talk to my boys about this. But, you know, (laughs) I've on occasion tended to lose my temper, and I know that it's not right. And every time I have to apologize, and then I say, okay, I'm not going to lose my temper again. Wouldn't it be great to be like, I'm never going to get angry again because I made that decision last week. So it doesn't matter what you do. I'm fine. Or how about something really hard like forgiveness? I know I'm supposed to forgive. I know that it's good for me to forgive. I know that God has forgiven me more than I could ever have to forgive somebody else. So I'm going to decide it's the right thing to do, and I'm going to forgive. So guess what? Angela, doesn't matter what you do to me. I've already forgiven you. It doesn't matter if the guy on the street commits a crime of atrocity against me even, because I've already forgiven him. But we live in a fallen world, don't we? And it's hard when we come up against things like that. And so even the Bible confirms this. Uh, Paul wrote to Timothy. In 1 Timothy, he says, Timothy, keep fighting the good fight and take hold of the eternal life. I'm thinking, fight the good fight? Didn't Jesus do that? Like, didn't he win the battle for us? So why do we have to keep fighting? because we live in this world, because we have flesh still, and we have to keep fighting. James, good old James, takes it a little bit further. James chapter one, he says, count it all joy when you encounter various trials. (laughs) First of all, he says when, not if. So we know we're going to encounter some trials. And then he has the audacity to tell us to count it all joy. Well, I don't know about you, but I find that difficult. I find that really difficult and a lot difficult more than just talking about dinner. That's hard for me, but I'm talking about the hard stuff. So I wanted to just kind of talk about that a little bit this morning. <clears throat> I know 2020 was a terrible year. There was a lot of hard stuff, but some of us are still living some hard things. And uh, Michael and I have encountered several hard things over our 30 years of marriage. <laughs> Kudos to him. But um, like, you know, years ago, we encountered a lot of financial problems. Uh, We lost our business. We actually lost our home. Um, We couldn't pay our bills. And uh, we, we used the local food bank. We know what it's like to be in need financially. We know what it's like. Some of you know the story, but we know what it's like to have a child to go way off course and have issues with drugs and mental illness and even jail time. And we own our own business, so we know what it's like to have trouble at work when somebody doesn't, well, they're just not reasonable. (laughs) And there's nothing we can do no matter what we do. We just can't seem to get them to common ground. So maybe some of you can relate to some of these things. Maybe you have some financial 
issues that right now they really seem insurmountable to you. Or maybe you have a child that has gone way far down the wrong road. You don't know how he's going to get back or she's going to get back. Maybe it's your marriage. Maybe you feel like your marriage is on the rocks. I don't know what to do. Or even maybe you've been to the doctor recently and you've had a health scare and you don't even know what your future holds. Well, if you can relate to any of these things, I'm glad you're here because I really, believe it or not, I want to encourage you this morning. (laughs) It got heavy fast, but I want to encourage you this morning because God has encouraged me. And so if you're here today and you're sitting there and you're thinking, no, I'm good. Well, then you better listen up and put this in your pocket because you will need it. Because when you encounter various trials, right? So I'm going to start with um, uh, the last letter that the Apostle Paul wrote. He wrote it to Timothy, and it's in 2 Timothy. And it was the last letter he wrote to Timothy because it was actually the last letter he ever wrote. You see, Paul was on trial for the gospel, and he knew that he was about to die. He was losing. They were going to execute him. And so, if you can, picture Paul sitting in prison, and he's writing to Timothy, and he knows his days are numbered. But what's interesting to me, if I try to put myself in his place, he's not writing to Timothy to say, oh, woe is me, look, it's what's going on, this is terrible, give me some sympathy, or please come over here and help me out, man, help me. No, he says something else. He just wants to encourage him. So let's put up 2 Timothy 1, verse 12. And this is our foundation of what I'm talking about today. It says, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed. And I am convinced that he is able to guard what I've entrusted to him until that day. He's sitting in jail about to die. And he says, I'm convinced that I can trust God. Wow. So I want to ask you, are you convinced? Are you convinced when you're going through the hard thing? When that hard obstacle hits you in the face, do you go like Paul? Well, I'm convinced. It's a little struggle though, right? Well, Paul went through more than just that. He didn't just live this wonderful life, and then all of a sudden at the end, oh my gosh, they're going to kill me. No. Let me read you a little list, okay? In 2 Corinthians, Corinthians, we find this list. So he said, five times I received 39 lashes from the Jews. 39. That's one short of death, y'all. Five times he received that. Three times he was beaten with rods. Listen, you hit me one time on the leg with a rod and I'm down. I'm in a fetal position it's over. But three times he was beaten by rods. One time he was stoned. Now, we don't know for sure, but I kind of think that he was actually stoned to death because they thought he was dead. They picked him up. They threw him out of the city. And then his disciples came and gathered around him, and he got up and walked away. <laughs> Hallelujah. But we don't know for sure. But anyway, he was stoned. Uh, three times he was shipwrecked. Many, many times he was in danger from robbers the wilderness, stranded at sea, false brethren, which is really a terrible thing, uh, sleepless nights, hunger and thirst, cold exposure, and through all of those things, Paul concludes at the end of his life, I can trust God. Wow. Wow. So there's a lot of things that I'm sure Paul believed, he knew the truths, he, he, he walked through them, and I'm sure that he knew a lot of things that kept coming to his mind that helped him so that when he got into a hard position, he thought of them and he knew that he could trust God. So I, I just want to share just a few of them this morning that I personally think of when I'm going through some hard stuff. And 
I believe with all my heart that if you can grab a hold of these and you can believe them, that you won't be so tossed about when the hard things hit you. Because, I mean, they're going to hit us. We're faced with hard stuff. I tell you, Ephesians 4 um, talks about being tossed about. Kind of, we, we sang a song about being tossed about too, but uh, it says, when we start being mature, then we stop being tossed about by every wind and wave when we start being mature. Now, he didn't say that when we start being mature, we'll stop being hit by the winds and waves. No. We'll still be hit by them, but we won't be tossed about by them. And I call that some stability. I could use some more stability. What about you? So I think about positioning ourselves. You know when, you, you know when something's about to come, you, you position yourself. I, I think about a shortstop. You know, when a right-hander comes up to bat and the shortstop, he goes, ooh, this might be mine. And he positions himself, right? He's getting ready. So I looked up the term position yourself. And it says, to position yourself means to occupy a certain place, to be situated. So when I ask you, where are you situated when hard things come? Do you know where you're situated? Are you prepared or do you expect them? Do you have a plan for spiritually how you're going to respond? Do you have a plan emotionally how you're going to respond? Um, can you say, like Paul, no matter what, I trust God. Because I think that if we focus on the truths of the word, that will endure well, will fight the good fight, and maybe sometimes we can find some joy in it. So here's the first, the first thing I want to talk about, the first truth, is that God allows us to collaborate with him. God allows us to collaborate with him. <clears throat> now think about that. Sorry. <clears throat> the God, okay. Ready? <laughs> Went down the wrong way. Okay. <clears throat> the God of the universe wants to work with you. He trusts you. What? We're co heirs with him, right? We're supposed to be co laborers, too. So that means some hard stuff. I love Proverbs 21, 31. I love it because it says, prepare your horses for battle, but the victory belongs to the Lord. Yeah, you got a role to play. Go ahead and get that ready. But don't you ever forget that God is the one who gives you the victory, right? So he doesn't just do all the work. He doesn't just say, hey, I just want you to sit down. Don't worry your pretty little head. I got this. Could he say that? Yes. Does he probably sometimes? Yes. But what he would love is if we collaborate with him. Because he knows that we're made in his image. And if we're made in his image and he's creative and he's very involved, you know he got his hands dirty just to create us? He could have spoke it, but he didn't. He like, he worked his way to create us. That's pretty awesome. So he knows we're like him. So he, we want to be involved. We want to be creative. And when we work alongside with him, then he provides the victory. Wow! So we've got victory. It doesn't mean everything goes our way. It doesn't mean we never have any hard times. But it means when we do, that God works something good in us and that he provi provides a victory. Isn't that awesome? But boy, is that exhausting. <laughs> Am I right? Okay, well, God promised us rest too. He's got us covered every way. Let's look at Matthew 11, starting with verse 28. He says, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and I will 
give you rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So let's put that picture up. Y'all know what a yoke is? Okay, so this is the real deal, y'all. I didn't get this off the internet. I took this picture myself in Honduras on a mission trip a couple years ago. So I, I walk across the street and I turn around. I'm like, what? That is what? So I had to take a picture. Look at these oxen and they've got this big piece of wood in between them, joining them together. That's a yoke. That's what it means when it says a yoke. So it's yoking them together. It means that they are connected. And when one moves, the other moves. When one moves, the other moves. And that's what God wants us to be, next to him moving. But he can take the brunt of the labor and we still get to keep moving with him. That is pretty awesome. We just need to trust him. So I think about that. Man, God's going to take the brunt. I can trust him. Here's the second principle. It's a, or truth. It's the principle of sowing and reaping. I love the principle of sowing and reaping. Let's look at Galatians 6, 7 through 9. It says, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to please the flesh from the flesh will reap destruction. And whoever sows to please the Spirit from the Spirit will reap eternal life. So don't become weary in doing good, for at the proper time, you will reap a harvest if you don't give up. Now, I think everybody knows that if you plant a rose bush, you're not going to get peaches. Right? You're going to get roses. And if you plant a peach tree, you're going to get peaches. So we know this in the physical, but it's true in the spiritual as well. So don't forget the last part, though. He says, if you don't give up, which means you need to be constant. You need to keep on keeping on. Because guess what? If you've planted a lot of not so great seeds and then you start planting your good ones, well, the bad ones are still coming up. Ah! But keep planting the good ones because eventually the bad ones are going to go away and the good ones are going to just start to flourish. So my question is what kind of fruit do you want? It's your choice. It is your choice. I want the good, mature fruit. So I choose to position myself. I stay close to Jesus. And I decide every day to plant the good seeds. All right. Here's the, your last one. Strongholds. Strongholds. Now, you might be like me, and every time you think of a stronghold, you think... Ooh, that's that negative thing that has a hold of you that keeps you from doing what you know is right. And, you know, it, it's something the devil uses to, to just grab a hold of you. And that can be true. But I'm going to read you the, just the general definition. You listening? Y'all still with me? Okay. All right. A stronghold is a place where a particular cause or belief is strongly defended or upheld. A stronghold is a protected place where members can defend themselves. It's a refuge. It's a place that has been fortified so as to protect against attack. It's a strong tower. That's what our stronghold should be. That's our God, y'all. That's our God. I think, because see, in biblical times, when the enemy was invading, that's what they called the stronghold. Run! Run to the stronghold! So everybody would run to the stronghold so that the enemy couldn't get to them. But I think we've twisted this idea, or maybe Satan's twisted this for us, into believing that the only stronghold there is is the negative one. 
not true. Don't let him steal that. Okay, let me prove to you. Psalm 62, verses 5 through 8. And I got this from the message because I really loved it, particularly in the message. It says, God, the one and only, I'll wait as long as he says. Everything I hope for comes from him, so why not? He's my solid rock under my feet, breathing room for my soul, an impregnable castle. I'm set for life. My help, my glory are in God. Granite strength, safe harbor God. So trust him absolutely, people. Lay your lives on the line for him, for God is a safe place to be. Let's see that picture again. Is that what I just described? That is God. Granite strength, safe harbor God stronghold. Now, negative strongholds do exist, but they exist because you ran to them. You found comfort in that alcohol. You found comfort in that fear. You found comfort in that medication. You found comfort in the victim mentality, you found comfort somewhere other than God. You chose. And so the next time a hard thing happened, you ran to it again because, well, it helped last time. And then you do it again and again, and pretty soon you got a habit. Can anybody relate? Okay, I will. So you, you... You have a habit, and even though you realize, oh, this isn't so comforting anymore. Oh, this is kind of pulling me. Man, you still go to it, even though you realize it's a counterfeit. Because now you're hooked. So I'm going to ask you, when something goes wrong or something hard happens, where do you run? Where do you run first? Whatever that is, it might have a hold of you. And it has a hold of you because you ran to it. It has a hold of you because you have a hold of it. So quit running to it. Whatever it is. Choose to position yourself. Choose to run to Jesus. And we do that by worshiping like this morning. Do you do that at home? Do it at home because that's where you position yourself. And I like to say, not just when things are going okay and you feel like worshiping. When you don't feel like worshiping and things are bad, that's especially when you need to worship. Because when you worship, you're lifting God up and he flows right back on you. And that's what you need. Go to his promises. Go to that person who loves Jesus and loves you, and you know that they're not going to pull any punches. They're going to say, well, have you gone to Jesus? Well, what did he say? You're not doing that right. Go to Jesus. Like, that's the person you need to go to if you go to a person. So, the conclusion here is that These things that we face, these obstacles that we face, these things that we're like, oh, I got to decide this again. It's not drudgery. It's preparation. It's positioning yourself. So I'm convinced that positioning yourself is comprised of daily choices. Now, some days we're going to choose really good and we're going to feel really great about ourselves. And then other days, I messed up. But good news, God is the God of second and third and fourth and million chances because he loves you. And so you just wake up again and you position yourself again. You make the decision. You become convinced 
You take the action over and over again. So when the really hard thing comes, you don't throw up your hands and start complaining and fall down and everything's just over. No, because you're ready. You're ready to collaborate with Jesus right next to him. You're ready to obey and sow the good seeds no matter what, no matter how it feels, no matter what that other person does, because you trust in Jesus. And so you run to him because you know that he is your stronghold. Right on? So I go to the gym a lot. I love the gym. And uh, the instructors have this quote that they say. And uh, it, it's when you got that weight. And no matter how heavy it is, it gets heavier, you know, after so many reps. And so it's, just, it's so heavy. And it'll go, it hurts so much. And you hope that this eight times that they're counting off is really eight this time. Because they always add to it or they forget their number. Anyway, and then all of a sudden the instructor says, you feel that pain? Oh my God. <laughs> I will be honest with you. My first thought is always, yes, I feel that pain. You want me to make you feel some pain? I, th I just think it. I don't say it. <laughs> but... And then they say, that's weakness leaving your body. And I'm like, yeah, it is a weakness. Your weakness leave that body. You get it? Pumps me up. So I just want to encourage you that next time the hard thing hits you and you feel the pain, that you position yourself next to Jesus. You sow the good seeds. You run to him and you say, I feel that weakness leaving my soul. Because it is. Because you're positioning yourself. <laughs> so I, um, as I prepared for this, I realized that all of these decisions over and over again starts with one decision. It really does. It starts with the decision to follow Jesus in the first place. So I'm gonna take you back to 2 Timothy 1.12, but this time it's in the Passion Translation. It's really my favorite translation. I'm gonna read it to you. Same verse. The confidence of my calling enables me to overcome every difficulty without shame, for I have an intimate revelation of this God. Isn't that good? So everyone's got to start somewhere. And that's where we start, with an intimate revelation of God. So I just sitting here thinking that there's got to be somebody here who's realizing, man, I need an intimate revelation of God. Maybe it's your first time in church in forever. Maybe you're here almost every Sunday. I don't know. It doesn't matter to me. But if you need that intimate revelation of God, Today's your day. Today's your day. Because I want you to know, I'm talking to you, that God loves you. He loves you because he loves you. Because he loves you. He loves you so much that he sent his only son down to earth. Jesus. And he led an sinless life, but he still died. He died a torturous death for you, for me, to take away our sins because we're not perfect, but he is. And then he rose again 
to conquer that death. And he offers you today eternal life. It's that simple, y'all. It's just that simple. He, he did that so that you could have an intimate relationship with him. So I'm going to go old school. I want everybody to bow their head and close their eyes. I'm not going to ask you to do anything publicly that you don't want to do, but I would love for you to bow your head and close your eyes with me. And I'm going to ask you right now, I'm talking to you, right now where you sit, do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God? Do you believe that he died for you and that he wants relationship with you? Every head bowed and every eye closed. Are you ready to believe? Do you want to believe? Today's your day. If you are, would you just pray with me? Inside your heart, inside your own mind, no one else is around, just you and God. Jesus, I believe you are God. I believe you love me. I believe you died for me. And I need you. I'm not perfect. Nowhere near it. I need you. So please come in. I invite you into my life. Wash away my sins. Because I've had a revelation of who you are. And I want a relationship. And I receive right now everything you have for me. Thank you, Jesus. Amen.